Hello everybody, what's up? You're listening to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon, the podcast that dives into music, film and games and everything else in between. My guests on this week's episode are writer-director Paul Spurrier and David Allen Gluck, the creative team behind the three-part television series Eulinia, starring Alec Newman and Vithra Pansingram. Eulinia tells the story of wealthy businessman Mark Hammond and his dark obsession to find the perfect deal in Bangkok, Thailand. We jumped into Paul and David's experience of how they met working in the Thai film industry, how the dark side of successful businessmen like Steve Jobs influenced the characters and story of Eulenia, and what's it like filming at the famous airplane graveyard and avoiding Bangkok jail. So, if you're running, stuck in a traffic jam, or sitting behind a desk at work, I hope you enjoy my interview with Paul and David. So just a little introduction to start with. Who are you and what are your roles in the project? I'll start. Um, I'm Paul, Paul Sparrier. I was the uh, director and I suppose creator of this. Um, and with me here is... Uh, this is David Cluck. I was the producer on the project and uh, this is uh, Paul and I's third collaboration i think so yes yeah here in thailand and um yeah i was uh you know paul uh is actually paul's actually being quite modest paul was not just the director on the project he wrote the script uh he was the cinematographer editor and composer as well (laughs) and then paul's wife nui who's not with Mm -hmm. us on this interview she was also one of the producers and you know was a great contributor to the production in terms of overall help as well What's uh, Eulenia about and why did you want to make this miniseries? Well, obviously, I've uh, I've been in Thailand now for about, oh, goodness, 15 years, I think. Um, I first came over to to shoot my first feature film in Thailand. It's called uh, P, uh, which is currently on Netflix, um, and basically never left. Mm -hmm. Um, We made another film uh, called The Forest, which uh, also went out on Netflix and and is now on Amazon. Uh, And and so then, I mean, so I was pretty much, I wouldn't say I was stuck in Thailand, that sounds rather negative, but I I made a home here and a family and a life here. And obviously you always, uh, I was always looking for the stories to tell in Thailand. Mm. And and trying to find something a little different. Uh, you know, a lot of action films, sort of martial arts-based films are made here for obvious reasons, uh, because of the great Thai boxing. Um, and then, you know, there were the stories of the, 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 you know, the lonely tourist expat who comes to Thailand and falls in love with a Thai bar girl. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, we've all read books on that scene. Yeah. Um, and so really what is, I thought there were so many other stories to, to tell here. And obviously, you know, one of them is, is about the, the people who misbehave in Thailand yeah. and the expats, the foreigners and the exploitation. And so I came up with this very, uh, very dark story of this one man, uh, Marcus Hammond, a, a billionaire who sets up business in in Thailand, uh, in Asia, uh, but who has a very dark secret, and uh, it really gets quite dark, wouldn't you say, David? Yeah, it's a, it's yeah, it's it's um, not your average story in a mm. in a good way. It is it is pretty dark. I think some people find it a bit shocking because it's not it it does take you a bit of a surprise in the first episode when you until you really find out what's going on but it's uh i think the for me the the genius of the script and especially in the first episode is that it sort of you sort of think you know what's going on you think you're sort of on to, oh, okay this is one of these kinds of stories and then it, it just takes a, a very interesting twist and then the subsequent the, of, of these first three episodes, the subsequent storyline, um, yeah. it just gets more interesting because then the audience is sort of learning about this character and sort of his rationale, his justification, his uh, self-righteousness to a, a degree in terms of, of, of his particular path and, and what he thinks is acceptable, why he thinks it is acceptable. And, um, but there's also, of course, then our young lady uh, plays Leck, who is uh, 
who basically forces our hero, quote unquote, to meet his match in a great way. Right. And that's avoid too much of the story, but it is uh, it is complex and it's very satisfying uh, ending. So just sort of jumping back to the very beginning to frame the creative journey um, of this project, I mean, Paul and Dave, you sort of mentioned you worked together as a director-producer team um, on The Forest, uh, and I believe, did you, um, what was the other project that you worked on? Funny enough, the, the first time uh, we met and worked together, David was, I suppose, my client in a way. He came to Thailand to make a film uh, called Formosa Betrayed. Right. And uh, we, we never, it was actually set in Taiwan, but uh, I think David's a little dyslexic. We never actually told him it got the wrong country, so he, he ended up filming it in I Thailand. Bought, I bought a plane ticket, I get off, and I'm, <laughs> here I am, right? And they're like, yes, sure, perfect, Absolutely. stay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. no, it was actually, the Thai, Formosa Betrayed was a period drama set in 1980, a political drama, loosely based on, on some true incidents that happened set in Taiwan in 1981 uh, for political reasons and logistical reasons. It was not really feasible for us to shoot in Taiwan. And I've had a number of friends who had worked in Thailand. And um, after doing some research, I found a company that Paul at the time was associated with and hired a production services firm. And we shot for two weeks in Chicago and then for five weeks in Bangkok on that movie. Okay. And that was where Paul and I first worked together. Paul was our uh, sort of our point person on the production side. So my first experience was Paul, with Paul was more of a line producer type, right. because Paul was more of an all, mm -hmm. all around filmmaker mm -hmm. kind of guy. The, the, Thailand has actually become a very popular place to make films. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, just about every Vietnam War film ever made has been, you know, shot in Thailand. And uh, right now, what I mean, the Sergio was shot Sergio, here. Extraction so, with Luke yeah. Hemsworth, um, The Five Bloods, The Five Bloods. Spike, Spike they were all shot in Thailand. So we were expecting a very good year this year. Last year was a record year for production in Thailand for international production. Uh, I just want to jump into, you worked in a sort of professional capacity. I mean, clearly you are, you're, you're friends. So I just, yeah, so I just wondered what those sort of um, initial conversations were and how you felt that you could potentially sort of like work together in a sort of a bigger capacity. Well, I think, again, it probably came about because of our mutual sort of uh, respect and appreciation for, for, for the crews and the filmmaking that you could do in Thailand. Um, you know, I mean, I, I obviously came from England originally and worked there and made a film and uh, living there. But, you know, when I first came over to Thailand and I, and I discovered, you know, the crews and the talent and, um, and the locations and, and, and of course the weather's not bad either. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> food's pretty good. The food's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it was, wow, this is, this is really a place that, uh, is kind of not only, like efficient and uh, and uh, but also actually creatively inspiring, mm. and I, I don't want to speak for David, but I suspect that after that first experience, he, you know, he was like me, looking for ways to to realize this potential. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, it was a matter of after doing for most of betrayed, and then I started coming back, you know, just sort of on holiday and spending time here, and so immediately, you know, um, just because Paul and I had, had remained friends and. You know, talked about collaborating on ideas, and it was like, well, let's find something. We got to make a, you know, do something here. It's, it's the crews are great. It's a, it's a fun place to work. Uh, and, and like Paul said, the the city, the Bangkok is is. I love what I always liked what um, Zach Galifianakis said when he was interviewed about doing Hangover Two here. He said right. Bangkok is the most unboring city on the planet, and it's true. And and to me that just that to me that lends to great storytelling. It's visually stunning city. Um, there is uh, a bit of a wild west element to it, but there's also a very high tech element to it, which I didn't expect at all when I first came here, and how advanced it is, and uh, and then how creative and talented most of the crew members are. The art departments, the graphics people, the camera grip electric departments. These are incredibly dedicated, hardworking, fun, uh, interested and interesting folks, which is nice. 
And, and I guess that definitely informs the sort of like writing process, and especially for you, Paul. And I'm guessing right around the time you were sitting in front of Final Draft, um, the Virginia Roberts yeah. claim against Jeffrey Epstein broke, and there's also the Malaysian government. One MDB fund was being investigated for fraud and money laundering. I mean, did any of these um, events play a part in shaping the themes of the story? I mean, I know there's a lot to unpack here, sort of politically and socially and sort of geographically. Well, look, the funny thing is that, in fact, a lot of this, the, 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 what we see in the news, um, wasn't happening when I wrote the original script. Wow. Uh, so, I mean, yes, you're right. You know, certainly <laughs> there are parallels between the sort of, you know, the Jeffrey Epstein and, uh, and our character, maybe not, not in a sort of sexual way, but in, certainly mm. in terms mm. of, you know, the exploitation, the feeling of being so powerful that you're rules beyond, the rules don't apply. Um, you know, I think in the past, we all, I was brought up to always sort of, you know, admire people who were successful, who were rich, uh, who'd made something of themselves. And we always looked up to those people. And I think something's happened, uh, at least in, in my mind over the last few years, which is, we started to realize that being successful, being a great businessman, doesn't automatically mean you're a great person. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I mean, I was there's a statistic that says that in fact, people who are incredibly successful, the entrepreneurs, the super wealthy, or they call the one percent, they're up to ten times more likely statistically to be sociopaths. Right. Uh, there's something like twice as likely as most prison inmates. Uh, so, you know, we are, we're beginning to realize that, that some of the traits, some of the ruthlessness that makes you great and rich in business, uh, maybe uh, not entirely desirable traits. Mm. So, I mean, that was certainly something I wanted to explore in Eulenia. You know, what is what is good and somebody can be successful, but they can not necessarily be good. And I think, you know, those are the things that we've seen. And look, uh, you know, Harvey Weinstein, the whole Me Too thing again came out after we had, you know, started production. Right. And, uh, and again, the same thing, you know, realizing that uh, there were some pretty unpleasant people out there who have had a lot of power and have been considered, you know, great members of society up until the time the truth came out. <laughs> until they're dragged away in handcuffs, yeah. yeah. I mean, there definitely has been a dramatic reassessment of rich, white, straight males' influence within, especially within the film industry over the last couple of years. And just sort of drawing upon that a little bit more, I mean, what are your thoughts and feelings about that? I mean... The, the I guess the film industry is a very sort of like broad church, but in your sort of experience, and again, like I don't want you to libel or get, um, get into sort of trouble, but have you had any sort of like direct experience of being in the presence of these very, uh, I guess, almost sort of like emperor-like um, figures within your sort of like working careers? Um, well, for me, for David, I mean, I've had, partly because I've, I work, in addition to working as a producer, I work as a first assistant director on a lot of movies. So, and I've been doing that for about 30 years. So I've come across a lot of interesting, fun, exciting, uh, and sort of devious people, mm. sadly. That is the business and there's no point in trying to sugarcoat that. And I'm, you know, it's not about naming names, not, it's not gossiping. It's just saying that that's, sometimes that's the people who get stuff done. Mm. Um, it's not always the nicest guy who gets it done and it's, it's a pretty ruthless business, and sometimes you need a ruthless person to be successful. I mean, I had limited dealings for personally with Harvey Weinstein when I had done a. I worked on a film called The Artist in mm -hmm. 2011, and uh, and you know, and and Weinstein Company was not involved in The Artist in, except after they saw a cut of it, uh, the the finished film actually at, at Cannes, and they did a preemptive buy a right. to, to buy rights for the US and a few other territories. But, um, you know, but Harvey was around when, you know, during the award season and I got invited to come to a lot of different functions and stuff like that. And he was around and, um, but I, you know, so I never had like, you know, sit down intimate conversations with him, but you were definitely around and in the presence of a, of a guy who, who sort of walked on air. He, mm. he was surrounded by people. He was, you know, he, you know, you got the sense that he was very much in control of his domain, and, and there were right. people around him who were helping him on a on a purely business level. Mm -hmm. So I never, I certainly never, luckily never experienced or saw anybody or had any 
friends that had gone through any sort of hardships with him. But he was definitely, you know, a enigmatic, fascinating guy. Um, you, but can I so, jump in? Yeah, I mean, please. what I've heard. Uh, although everybody was sort of um, wanted to get in business with Harvey Weinstein for a long while because he had money and he could uh, bring your yeah, projects to fruition. Mm. I mean, I think it's fair to say that not many people actually liked him. I mean, oh. a horrible reputation as a bully. And I think that's what people are. Of course, people are focused on the, you know, his uh, sexual abuses, but in fact, it strikes me that he was just a horribly bullying person in I, business, I, yeah. in friendships, in all walks of life, and that carried over onto the way he treated women. Yeah, yeah. and I think I, I made the comment years ago to somebody or a couple years ago that my feeling about Harvey Weinstein wasn't that he should, I mean, what, what happened to him, you know, you know, I think he sounds like he's deserving of the punishment that he's now living with, but I think that irrespective of that, he should have been canceled many years earlier for just being a pretty devious businessman mm. um, and a bully. I mean, I know I I know a lot of people who had dealings with the Weinstein Company that, you know, really struggled to get their money out of them. There were a lot of lawsuits. There was a lot of manipulation, a lot of fraudulent sort of behavior. And so to me, it kind of goes hand in hand with somebody like that who feels they can get away with, you know, screwing the average filmmaker over in terms of they might be owed in their royalties and also then thinking well this woman wants to be an actress so she better sleep with me if she wants to get anywhere in this business and it's it's a, a permissiveness that they think they have or this permission slip to be uh, evil i just wanted to uh, just sort of touch a little bit on the financial industry here as well because that's very much part of the of the story i mean that goes hand in hand with the film industry as international banks and hedge funds and wealthy individuals provide funding for films i mean what's your experience been like working with film investors and did that in a way inform the way that you sort of treat the financial sort of aspect of this particular story well look uh, i think i've been very lucky um in that ever since, let me think, you know, my first film in Thailand, some of the investors have stuck with me. And so we've always had a, you know, we've worked with a fairly small number of, of private investors. Um, because you hear so many horror stories about, you know, the people like Harvey Weinstein coming in and, uh, and, and you know, changing the script, changing the plot, uh, deciding who gets to play the roles and, and unless you're careful, replace you as director with somebody else. Um, and I mean, I think another thing that David and I have always shared is a feeling that that you can probably get better work done if you're actually having a decent time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. enjoying the process and everybody's working together in harmony. Uh, I mean, the three films I've done in Thailand um, and the fourth we're working with David, you know, I, I think um, have been, uh, you know, fun productions. Uh, and I think that comes from, you know, the investment down that everybody has to understand that you're working together and trying to make something good and to you know, get on board it. So, I mean, I've spent most of my life trying to avoid these sort of horror stories of the, you know, the the evil film <laughs> investment funds and things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I my my experience with that has been, I mean, for most of it, trade was all private funding that my former partner had raised, the vast majority of that, and then I helped with that. Um, but other than that, um, my work in production, you know, as a hired gun, certainly with... Um, an interesting collection of different types of financing entities and investors and, and, you know, hedge fund types. And, you know, I mean, look at Steve Mnuchin was a, you know, a hedge fund manager type guy who got in, involved in film investment, um, who's now the, you know, Treasury secretary of the United States. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an, uh, it's an attractive business. And certainly, I think only a very, very small percentage of films actually make any real money. So you're actually, I think, pretty lucky if you if you are making money in this business. And uh, so a lot of your smart, diligent investors sort of steer clear from film investment. So they sort of have to have a reason, whether that's the allure of it or they really believe in the filmmakers or, 
you know, you sort of, you want to get that. And I think Paul and I have been lucky that we did have some people that um, believed in us and, uh, um, you know, frankly, and, and certain people, and, and, and they knew what they were getting involved in and they got right. it, were part of it. And we even turned down investment from some people that we didn't think were going to get it, that weren't going to be, weren't going to be understanding of, of kind of the process and, and how, how we chose to work. Well, look, the other thing that's always tricky about, you know, films from a financial point of view is that they really walk this uneasy line between, you know, something that is art and something that is commerce. And obviously there are films that are made that are entirely commerce. And then the other end, there are films that are made that are entirely art. And, uh, you know, if you're brave, you try and do both at the same time. Uh, that's, that's probably the trickiest thing. Um, and of course, you know, the artists don't understand the, the capitalist investors and the capitalist investors don't understand the artists. So it, it can be a powder keg. <laughs> Um, so just jumping into the sort of creative process here a little bit, um, as you sort of mentioned before, um, David, you were our first assistant director on major Hollywood films like The Artist, Gold and Ava. So what was it like putting yeah. your producer hat on again and reading Paul's script for the first time? And what kind of notes and feedbacks did you give him uh, afterwards? Well, it, it, that's interesting because, um, you know, I had been following a number of projects that Paul had written. And when he first started sending me scripts and you know talking about ideas i always said paul was kind of the idea machine and um what happened was we were actually working on the release of the forest which was the, the film previous to eulenia um and you know it was going well we'd made a deal with netflix and we had a, a small theatrical release and we we put a lot of elbow grease a personal elbow grease in making the the uh theatrical release in thailand something special we flew the stars of the film the two kids that were in the film we brought them down and it was fun to have a week with them here and and uh be here for the for the press screening and then the week of release so paul and i were literally at dinner one night and i said okay so what's what's next got to do something next you know and that was just me the, the 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 business side of me saying let's let's do something next and you know Paul was like, I need to take a break. And I said, well, you don't get to take a break. We've got to do something. So he said, I want to do Eulenia. <clears throat> and I, I was kind of shocked because there's another project that he has that I'm a, a fan of. And I thought that was more, would, would, I just thought that was going to be his next choice. So I reread the script and because uh, it had been a couple of years since I'd read it. So I reread it and the, then immediately we just started talking about, okay, well, how do we do this? What do we you know, we got to find an actor. I said that the, the biggest challenge, of course, is finding the actor um, and uh, a couple of key locations. Um, so that was the first big hurdle. And then the second was finding these three young actresses. And Paul was sort of adamant from the beginning, which I completely agree with, is that the, the point was to, you know, with the Thai actresses is that we wanted to go outside of the normal sort of casting avenues because uh, Paul was not interested at all in, in the kind of the Thai soap opera kind of actress. You know, uh, he wanted somebody that looked like they could have been from up country. They had a, uh, a, a, a fresh and uh, sort of a raw uh, appeal about them. And so as we did develop and move, move forward with this on the business side as well as the creative side, um, we auditioned uh, 150 mm -hmm. girls maybe. Right. Well, to give a little background, um, you know, there's, there's, lots of, uh, there's lots of things I love about Thailand. There's some great talent here. But one of the things that has always slightly irritated me is that film stars or TV stars very much come from a sort of similar background. There's all the same pattern. You know, you it's very hard for an actress to get work in Thailand, for example, if she's dark skinned or she comes from the Northeast or, you know, has that uh, the looks of somebody from the Northeast. And, and that just seems ridiculous. Um, and so you tend to get the TV screens, you know, filled by, you know, light skinned, uh, upper class Bangkok girls. And that just misses out a whole swath of, of very talented people. 
And uh, now I understand if you're making things for a Thai audience, then okay, you have to cater to the Thai audience needs. But we weren't. We were making something for an international audience. So I thought it was a real opportunity to find the talent that wasn't getting an opportunity at the moment and find new, fresh talent. Yeah. And, and you know, with, I think with great, good, with good fortune, we did that. Mm. And obviously coming across Alec was great. That, that was such a coup for us. So that was great. I mean, and the fact he's a great actor and a really great guy and, uh, you know, so game and so, uh, you know, adapted to the working style. So here's a guy who started in all these BBC series and international movies and international series and, and doing, you know, the well, exactly. Colin I mean, David show, which is a little different. You know, it wasn't like he was coming over with a, a whole group of other British actors. It was, you know, him on his own with a plane ticket coming over to work on something with two guys he'd never met before. I mean, he, he liked the script. I think that's what uh, attracted him to it. But uh, but now he was totally game and fun. Yeah. I mean, who do you kind of sort of approach in that sort of casting process for that Mar- Marcus's sort of like character? Um, well, we... Uh, I mean, to be honest, we we went to a, you do the normal thing. You go to agents, you send out scripts, you get uh, you know you you get screeners back, and you you look at them, and and very often, um, I don't know, I don't, but you sort of get a vibe. You see right. somebody, and and you just look at them and think that's our guy okay. um, and sometimes sometimes in the acting sometimes in the face something is something you don't really even quite know what it is and then of course it, that's a dangerous thing because once you've fixated on somebody uh, then if they if they demand way too much money or they're not available you end up having to sort of uh, change all your ideas but you know we were lucky that Alec um, was on board and uh, and jumped on a plane and did yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he was. He was. I mean, he's, yeah, he was great. He was a pleasure. So, mm. and uh, and has and has stayed with us. He's you know, remained a friend, oh, okay. and he's. So. I mean, funny thing, it was actually the same with our the, the female lead, um, a Thai lady called Om Cam. You know, we were seeing, like, it was virtually an open audition. I mean, we saw anybody, whether they had any experience, uh, a lot of experience, little experience, uh, you know, people who saw a notice on Facebook. Right. I mean, I think at one point we even went and handed out business cards to uh, taxi drivers and said, you know, we'll see anybody. We're looking for... Um, I mean, and to give a little context, I mean, the way we did the casting here and what's pretty typical, sadly, in Thailand, it, which I'm so used to casting in America, but it's not like people come in with a photo and resume. They just, that, that, that just doesn't exist here. Um, some of them come in with, you know, you, get, you may have a piece of paper with some of the shows, series that they've done or something like that here. But most of the people we were looking at, the vast majority, a lot of them came from some friends who had a, 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 a school, a, a film school, like an, an acting school. So we would see, we saw groups of people that would come in. And I remember, you know, there were times here in the, in the, in the office where Paul would just, you know, address about 30 of them at one time and say, so here's what's happening. We're going to call you upstairs into the casting room one at a time. And this is what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. But, um, but it's, it was so it wasn't that normal sort of hi come in hit that mark tell us your name what's your agency or your height you know it wasn't that at all so which which and which was great it was actually very liberating I think it was a very creative process with the casting and it put the people at ease a little bit more and uh, they, I mean you know uh, the choice of on cam I mean. I can't quite think why, in retrospect, we picked her because her English was very limited. No. I mean, we had to work through every every scene virtually karaoke style. Um, but there was just something about I don't know her personality. She had a certain charisma that uh, that uh, I think both of us. The moment we saw yeah. her, we just thought, oh, just, you know, okay. she, yeah, there's she's, the one. She, it, it, it's always fascinating. You hear stories about how it happens, but yeah. that's really how that did happen. And uh, just a funny story is that um, the uh, the girl who plays uh, in the in the first episode um, uh, who plays Nam uh, was actually just a Facebook friend of mine. Okay. Right, uh, and literally, uh, she had a good look. And I said, listen, we were just chatting on Facebook. I, don't know, I think we'd maybe met once in person. 
and she'd been living in Australia and she had just come back to Thailand. And uh, so I said, hey, I don't know if you've ever done any acting. She's like, no, never even considered it. And I said, well, this might sound sort of silly, but I'm actually, you know, producing a little project. And if you'd want to come read, it'd be, she goes, oh, that could be fun. So uh, having incredibly low expectations mm. for that was we were so totally surprised and how good she did. And she came back for a callback and we said, well, she's the one. She was just fantastic. And she had never done any acting before. I don't know if she ever will again. <laughs> I mean, she, she had a great time, but she literally is. I mean, she's living in Germany. She's, uh, you know, studying, she's getting a master's in hotel and restaurant management. And that's more of her dream. But uh, but I think she looked back on uh, on this experience and thought it was just a great time. And she did a great job. So, OK, so we sort of touched on a little bit um, before, but basically um Bangkok is a place of extreme wealth and poverty and the poorest parts of the city are sort of slowly sinking into the river at the moment. I mean, what was your, in terms of just on a sort of like filming, uh, sort of like scouting and stuff, did you come into any sort of issues of any sort of parts of the city you just simply couldn't enter due to the sort of, uh, due to it sort of sinking? You're quite right. There is a long-term problem with, uh, you know, the, the land of Bangkok. Uh, but, I mean, it's amazing. Thai people are very creative uh, and, and they will use uh, there are certain areas by the, the by the canals where they build their houses on stilts so as the water rises the stilts get higher um, but I mean look the one thing that of course and it's a bit sad is that you know we were shooting parts of this series in in what they call the Klong Thai slums which is one of the largest uh, areas slum areas in Southeast Asia and I mean, we never, we, we didn't go in with, you know, security and bodyguards. We were going in as a small team um, filming in these alleyways. And we never felt, at least certainly I never felt threatened or at risk. And, you know, the, the excitement of the people there to have somebody filming. And we virtually had to, you know, f force the people there to, to take our money because they were so excited. And then at the other end, you'll go to a, you know, an, uh, an office building, which you want to use for half a day, and they'll want, you know, $2,000 just to shoot in this one room. Mm. And so, again, it, it, it sort of reinforced to me this concept of greed and how sad it is that the people who have the most are the most greedy and demand the most, and the people who have the least are, the mo are so generous. We found that invariably throughout the shoot. And... Uh, I don't know, it, it taught us something, but it's also rather sad. And then just sort of following on from that, it's a deeply sort of spiritual place where witchcraft and magic is a common place for the most part, and that's something you touched on your first film in uh, P. Um, so how prevalent is that within the sort of like um, culture, and was that something you had to deal with? Because I remember reading in an interview with Eat My Brains that you, for the <laughs> P, that you had it, um, the, the set was sort of blessed. Was there sort of stuff like that going on as, as well now? Well, certainly. I mean, before every uh, the start of every production in Thailand, you have what's called a bungsuan ceremony, uh, where you do indeed you you present gifts and offerings and fruit and uh, uh, incense and red fanta. I don't know why red yes. fanta, but there's always has to be red fanta. Apparently, the gods like red fanta. God, I shouldn't yeah. say that. I'll be cursed now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but no, you do this, you know, to. And, and look, I mean, of course, one could choose to say that it's all sort of superstitious rubbish. Um, certainly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever say that. But the other thing is, it is actually a, a wonderful moment because you do it before the start of filming. And so you've got your whole crew and your cast, they all assemble, and you take this, this hour before you start filming to, you know, to peacefully bless the production. And, and I, I can't honestly say whether I think that uh, the spirits bless your production, but, but purely as a sort of meditative exercise mm. to, to get in the right mindset and to get to know each other and prepare yourself, I think it's a great thing. I think we should do it in England. Yeah, no, I, I, I can echo that. With every production I've done here, we've had that. And um, I, it's, it's funny, I've I, uh, done some little behind the scenes, you know, stuff with my iPhone while we were making Eulenia. And, uh, when we filmed at um, the actual, the house that you see where Marcus lives, the, the villa, what they call the villa, 
Um, it was actually down in Phuket. We found a place down there that suited our needs and we ended up packing everybody up and took two little trucks and flew, flew the cast and the rest of the crew down there. And we stayed there for about 10 days. And we had a big Boon Suan ceremony there. And it was really fun. And I think it, it I'll never forget, I remember taking video with my iPhone and there was Alec, who obviously had never been through that process before. Right. Being his first time in Southeast Asia. And, but, but a veteran of so many productions. And I, 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 he was genuinely moved by it. And uh, because the other actors, uh, Puwitia, who's uh, you know certainly probably one of the most famous Thai actors there is, was mm-hmm. very involved in the ceremony, was a great, he was, uh, he's such a great, kind, gentle spirit on set. And, and our other friend, Saha Jack, and, and, and the girls that were all, you know, our other girls that were in the film and the crew, it was just a great time. It was well, very- isn't it funny that, you know, although some of what we were doing was really quite, you might imagine that if you're making something that's sort of dark and broody mm-hmm. and unpleasant and lots of crying and way, you know, whatever, that it's gonna be a horrible film to shoot. Almost invariably, I find the opposite. You know, that, that, that the comedy is where everybody is meant to be having a lovely time and just Miserable, evil yeah. off there. And, uh, uh, you know, certainly there was there was no tension uh, offset. I mean, I always had a, a theory because my previous two films have sort of have come under the, um, uh, they would be considered genre films. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I did a lot of the, you know, the, the horror film festivals. And, and I always, I have a theory that I developed that the, the more disgusting and perverse and vile and bloody and gory the film, mm. um, always <laughs> the nicer and friendlier the filming. <laughs> and, and when you, sometimes you go to film festivals, they made some, you know, extremely sensitive drama about the, the plight of um, Guatemalan sheep herders. You know, the filmmakers are usually assholes. Yeah. Finally, just the one the one thing that I just wanted to get your sort of like take on in regards to this was that you know Bangkok is a sort of commonplace for rich, and uh, nefarious tourists to sort of sexually exploit young Thai women, um, and especially in sort of like uh, PU um, explore that, and it just seems. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know things have sort of like changed, but it definitely seems to form like a very sort of clear economic function within that society. It sort of functions around that. It definitely is sort of seen as a sort of commodity, very sort of transactional. But it does help, and essentially does help people. It does put food on the table. And I just wondered what your particular thoughts were of that, and if that is sort of a misconception. Well, look, I think it's fair to say that since 2004, when I made P, the economy of Thailand has improved enormously and so that sort of you know that nightlife uh, scene of, uh, of prostitution I don't think is anywhere near as prevalent as it was before I'm not saying it doesn't exist obviously but I think actually the way that has happened is the best possible way which is that that people have better options um, that they now have more choices, that they can find jobs that can pay them a living wage uh, in Bangkok. And so, because let's face it, I don't think anybody ever wanted to to work in, in, in go-go bars, mm. um, but it was a lack of economic choice. And uh, and so what you have to give is, is economic choice, which which I think has happened. And, and also what I found fascinating as well, that uh, Bangkok and what's of Thailand is actually, it's independent. It doesn't have any national debt. Um, I don't know if that's still the sort of like case, but it is sort of like fascinating that they do have that level of autonomy. Well, I don't know whether it'll be the same after COVID. Yeah, that's true. That's very <laughs> true. Every, everything we've ever, I mean, look, that's the thing. We, we were living in very strange times and we're talking about everything. Everything I'm talking about is based on three months ago. Mm. You know, who knows what the economy is going to be like. There's, you know, the, 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 the economy and the GDP of Thailand, 17% comes from tourism and we've got mm. no tourists. You know, does that mean that people, there are going to be less opportunities? Will we see a return of, you know, the situation where girls have to work in bars, but mm. if they do, who's going to visit them? I mean, look, everything we've known is, is up in the air right now. Yeah. So I'd just like to sort of jump into a little bit into the 
the sort of filming, the nuts and bolts of the sort of the filming of, of Eulanalia. Um, so, David, how many weeks did you schedule principal photography for, and what kind of sort of logistical challenges did you face moving the cast and crew around sort of Bangkok? Well, um, originally, originally we had planned for four weeks of shooting, and we had set it up based on uh, Alec Newman's schedule. So we had been, I, you know, I'd talked with his agent and, and found, made, you know, did, did a, my typical AD sort of breakdown of a one-line schedule and went over that with Paul and he was comfortable with it. And so that was then how we formulated our, our uh, the construct of our deal with, with Alec. So we filmed for about four weeks. We um, got all of Alec's work done. And then uh, we knew that we would probably have some more after that. I am um, part of the way we do things when Paul and I have worked together and, and even with other productions that happened here, because it's not like a big union show that I do where, you know, where you have a crew of 120 people and literally every day costs you $300,000. So we weren't dealing with that. And we knew that we would like to have the flexibility to get the work done that we needed with Alec. And if we needed additional stuff, Everybody else we were working with was going to be around if we needed some time. And there was other commitments that Paul and I had had literally just after we'd finished filming that we knew was going to take us down for a little bit. And I actually mentioned to Paul, I said, you know, let's let's do a cut once you start cutting um, during this time. And um, so that before we jump back into if we're going to jump back into you know, a, a big chunk of shooting or, you know, week long week of shooting. Let's make sure if we've missed anything that we can get it then, too. And I'm I'm just, you know, most movies I've ever worked on, have had some form of reshoot or additional photography. So I thought, well, let's just, you know, the, the goal of this was not to make a schedule. Some sometimes I'm hired on a movie. And the point is, we're not making a movie. We're making a schedule. Well, on this one, we weren't making a schedule. We were making a movie and we, and we owed it to ourselves and to our investors and our supporters to make the, do the best thing that we could. And to, to me, that meant uh, allowing us the greatest degree of creative freedom possible. Well, the other thing, just to jump in, I mean, the we've all seen the films and heard the stories of producers and directors, you know, fighting. And the cliche is the producers saying, you know, you can't shoot that scene. You can only have three extras. There's no more money. Uh, you can't have two cameras. And the director sort of rebelling and saying, I have to have more scenes, more extras, more money, and that being the clash. Mm. Um, and, I, and I actually think the way that we work together, because David is not just, you know, a money producer. You know, he is, he has uh, creative instincts. And so, you know, he wanted to give the film, you know, all the resources we could get. Um, I also think to give myself credit, I sort of was to a certain extent financially responsible. I, we, <laughs> we had, I guess saying we were having inverse arguments. I said, I'm thinking, no, let's go spend a little more time with this scene. Plus, I, I can shoot this in a day. It's like, oh, maybe we should take two days. And really just like, no, I'm fine. I'm like, come on, you're you're supposed to be arguing with me for more time and more extras and more of this. Right. But, 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 you know, but also there was a trust there. I mean, there was, it's almost to a, a second hand. We have, we have a, a shorthand with each other, which was handy, but it, but not without its challenges. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we, you know, we would have um, some of our investor friends come, you know, hold a boom mic, uh, help us lock up traffic. It's like, guys, I need help here. We're shooting out in the countryside and I need you to get on the back of this motorcycle and run down and don't let any cars through kind of thing. Just, you know, and, you know, that was the, the extent of their experience on film sets. And so that's what we did is just was, you know, taking kind of dealing with those resources. But we did. We had a small crew that was with us every day, just a small group of people. And they were incredibly dedicated and very good at their jobs and 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 nice people. And so that made it actually made it fun for us. Uh, but it, I mean, it, it, it did have its challenges finding the locations. I mean, Paul and I just spent days and days and days and days scouting locations. And I would call, you know, friends of mine that were working on other big Western films. Say, I'm looking specific for this type of restaurant. Do you know of any play? You know, and then Paul would call his friends and, you know, and, and then we had some other wonderfully generous people that um, were just our friends and fans of our work and said, oh, you, you can welcome to shoot at my place if you want. And it's all oh, fantastic. So some people were just incredibly generous that, and they added so much to the movie because of their generosity. It was nice. But like I said, not without its challenges, but, but, you know, but, but the work, 
the goal was to make the best film possible. So there was never there was never uh, any animosity. There was never any conflict of interest from a standpoint of we're just trying to make the best film here. Um, you know, so and we knew what our resources were. And Paul is not the kind of director who just throws his hands up and says, I don't care what it costs. I want this. He, he gets it. Um, you sort of touched on it sort of briefly, but I just wanted to sort of dive in a little bit into the um, locations that you used, which are amazing. Um, so Marcus's Bangkok penthouse apartment, um, the villa, the plane graveyard. I mean, how did you go about gaining access to these places? And were they, I mean, were they particularly expensive? I mean, you have sort of mentioned that people were asking $2,000 uh, for some particular locations and stuff. But how easy was it to get sort of access? And did you need to get sort of filming permits to sort of be there? I, you know, sadly... <laughs> I think, and the same I'm sure is true of, you know, the UK and the US, you know, 30, 40 years ago, the idea of somebody coming to film in your, in, in your premises was, was exciting. And, uh, and you know, oh God, yes, you know, come and film in my place. I think people have all got rather too blasé about uh, these things. And so a lot of people now do realize and, and quite fairly i suppose that a lot of productions have have big money and why shouldn't they make some of it from using their place um so i mean that's always a challenge and i think one of the things that one always learns is that sometimes you don't get the place you want um i mean and there were a few that we wanted and we didn't get there was a scene that was meant to be at the top of a derelict building and it was about an hour and a half out of Bangkok, and we drove there at least once or twice and scouted it and planned, all ready to film it, all, it. Planned it all out. It's going to be a great sequence. Right. And then the owner sort of suddenly said he wanted three times as much as he originally had wanted for it. And I remember, you know, having that debate, oh, do we spend that money? And and in the end, we said, no, we'll find somewhere better. And uh, and we found this you know strange little tower in the middle of the Klong Toy era area, and I, and I think it was better. And and I I think it's something you I think it's something that you learn that uh, sometimes what do they say? It sounds like a cliche, but you know every problem is an opportunity or something yeah. like that. And they say, well, your instinct kicks in, and you start to say, you know what, this doesn't feel right anymore, especially when I think. I think sometimes finding a location, like with any creative part of a film, is, you know, you you fall in love with it. You get a passion for it. And then sometimes you fall out of love with it. And I've, that's happened to me on so many movies where I was, like, completely sold on something or someone. And then it ended up not being that that case. And we didn't get that location. And we found something better. And you're, you're, I think you have to listen to your spidey senses when it says, you know what? This doesn't smell right. This is – we uh, – Paul had put in a lot of time for this one location that we found and we'd driven out there twice, you know, uh, we had to hire a van to take us out there and, you know, and he'd, you know, kind of storyboard and planned this whole sequence. And I, you know, and I was great. It was excellent. I was like, this is going to be really good. And then ended up not getting it. And at first it was sort of devastating, but I, I, we definitely lucked out because we found better locations. But then you mentioned also the, the airplane graveyard, which is, which is wonderful because nobody really knows who owns that place. Mm. But there is a security guard who who guards it, and his job is to keep people out. Uh, but for you know a certain amount of money, he will actually let you in to film there. Uh, but you know you have to go on the right day when he's in a good mood and uh, <laughs> when the owner is going to be around. The owner, yeah, the owner's not coming. <laughs> so, so you know, again, you you do what you have to 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 make it happen. Yeah, yeah. So it's and that's and that's a little bit of a I mean, for when you're working on a big Western production mm. and you know you have you know trucks and trailers and like I said, 150 people to show up at a location. You better make sure a, all your ducks are in a row. And I think sometimes Paul and I would be like, you know, this one, well, we can take a risk. We can we can give this a shot, you know, but because, you you know, do you I mean, a contract with, you know, a security guard who guards an airplane graveyard. Uh, I don't know how enforceable that's going to be in a court. <laughs> so, so you have to you know, go with your faith and say, well, we'll give it a shot. And if we don't, it's, you know, we'll come back tomorrow. We'll go somewhere else. And um, uh, but so it, it's kind of makes it fun, keeps it interesting. I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did. We you asked about film permits. I mean, we did have 
permission to film everywhere, apart from one location, which is at the start of, I think, episode two, when Alec is walking through a oh. park. Yeah. And... Uh, and there was a park near us, so uh, we had extra time, so we just went and filmed it. And uh, and indeed, the, 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 the park police came along and said, uh, what, what on earth are you doing? Where's your permit? You can't film here. But uh, thankfully, the moment yeah, they like, turned up was after we'd had uh, uh, the, yeah, the take. Couple, so couple we were, good takes, so we were okay. <laughs> <laughs> just, just leaving, yeah. So, yeah, it was, it was great. Mm-hmm. And, and I must say, like, you know, with... Uh, you know, like Alex, uh, the Marcus Hammond's office was, you know, that was a big ticket item for us. And then obviously his penthouse apartment, that was a matter of finding those places and making deals. Yeah, with we people. almost got arrested there as well, didn't we? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I think uh, there are certain <laughs> rules of like using drones without um, without uh, permission. Yeah, uh, that was hilarious. We, we, we were shooting at the at the office, and wanted to get these drone shots and um, then somebody from one of the other floors saw what we were doing. Well, well they, they thought we were sort of like peeping toms using a drone <laughs> to right. peep into their room. And in fact, we didn't even know it was a bedroom went anywhere near their apartment. Yeah. But they, they, I think they called the police and said there's yeah. some weird drone the, the spies spying on me. So uh, I, the funny part was then I was then I uh, was charged with getting Alec out of the building. And because we someone said the cops are on their way up. And so I remember Paul got well. Our priority the cards. was, you know, I don't, I don't mind being arrested, but I, it would be rather embarrassing if our star was arrested. So yeah. <laughs> at least get him out before the police get the handcuffs. Yeah. <laughs> but I, but I took all the footage we'd shot, all the all the cards, and I took Alex and we went downstairs to a little restaurant and we waited. And then <laughs> the police luckily never showed up, and we came back and we finished film. So it was great. So I just wanted to just jump into the um, the sort of you working as a uh, director because I know that you um, sorry I should know, I know Paul you started out as a child actor and one of your first roles was in the movie um, Wild Geese um, and it still still plays to this day and I just wondered in terms of your that experience and then your career as a child actor and then as an actor how that informed you working with actors now and whether you can very quickly develop a shorthand. Uh, we're communicating with them because of that experience. Ex-child actors generally go into one of sort of three character, uh, three categories. You know, they they even end up you know dying of a drug overdose, uh, or they sort of uh, claim they were coerced into it by their evil parents, or they end up in the sort of you know where are they now category. Um, so I. I I'm afraid I'm not yet totally addicted to drugs, and I still get along quite well with my parents. So I, I suppose I have to be in the where are they now in Bangkok, Thailand? Is the answer. Um, but I mean, look, I was very lucky at at an early age to be around sets and to be directed by a lot of different directors and some very good directors, and and I think. You know, that's where I, I, I learned about what actors need because I, I, I had been one and knew it. Um, so, I mean, because you get different sorts of directors. Some directors uh, are very much in the visuals. Um, some are very much in, in the story. And some are very much actors, directors. Mm. Um, mm. I suppose I've always, you know, your aim is always to try and cover all three bases. Um but I look at a very long winded answer to your question, but certainly I would say that, you know, one of the most fun parts of it is dealing with working with actors. And again, you know, Alec was uh, our lead actor, took took this part very seriously. And and we we rehearsed for a week before we started filming, which isn't always you're not always lucky enough to do that. And. And we would fight at times. I mean, he would say, you know, I don't understand why the character says this. And we would sit and we'd work it through until we worked out. And sometimes he was quite right. And but I think, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and so that process uh, was, I think, very important in terms of, uh, of, of working with the actor to get the character to feel real and rounded and, uh, and authentic. David, here, just real quick. I, I mean, I think Paul had a tricky duty because he had really two. I, it's hard to categorize them as two different kinds of actors, but um, 
I think with Alec, of course, with Pooh, with Sahajak and Donut, um, you know, he had actors that came to him with a lot of experience and also a lot of the tough questions, in, which which I welcome and I expect from an actor, you know, to have those kinds of questions. And then some of the other actors, certainly certainly our, our three girls who had uh, some had zero experience. Mm-hmm. It was then 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 it's then it's provides a completely different set of muscles. I think Paul needed to exercise to get a performance out of them. And and I, it was fun for me to kind of watch it and see see the the process go. And then also I saw how the how Alec and Pooh were also very supportive of their fellow actors and how they were great with the girls and helped to make them feel comfortable. You know, because they didn't know what to expect. They didn't know what what you can do, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. Can you you know do you push back on this? Do you just do exactly you know? what your instinct is. And I mean, we were lucky because Paul, like I said, he, he knows what an actor needs. He was an actor and he's, and he's got, he speaks Thai and he can communicate effectively very well with, with everybody on the set, whether it was the lighting crew or the actors and uh, the, the camera, you know, the focus puller and the makeup artist, you know, so we could talk to all those people. Um, but that was, I, I think, you know, it was a particular challenge because it was you, you had some incredibly experienced actors on one hand, and some credi- incredibly fresh, inexperienced actors on the other hand. I mean, the other thing I would say about um, not only working with the actors, but really the whole story of it. I think one has to understand that we weren't doing this within, you know, a big studio system. Um, we didn't have, you know, network controllers and commissioning editors looking over us and dictating, you know, the tone, the style, the content. And and I've always felt that if you have that luxury, which it really is a luxury, to to be working with a team of people to a certain extent where you can you have carte blanche to express whatever you want, you should sort of t- take advantage of it. And so the one thing we really were trying not to do with Eulenia was to 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 play it safe. Mm. And so, you know, there are elements that are that are as dark as dark can be. There are elements of humor. There's elements of psychological drama. Um, I think there are things that we did that you wouldn't normally get away with on certainly American network television, and possibly not even on, you know the BBC. Um, and so. I hope that that will give it a slightly different feel from the sort of things you normally see on on television, where you really don't quite know where it's going um, from episode to episode. And I think that what was very important to that was the freedom we had, the relationship David and I had working together, and the relationship with Alec, where he was saying, look, I'm not doing just a standard drama. Here we can we, we can go a bit wild. We can mm-hmm. explore directions which we normally wouldn't be allowed to. Yeah. And, and the fact that Alec took it seriously, and I think he, he took it seriously from a very professional standpoint, which was, which which I interpreted as, here was Alec, he's... He's coming off to Thailand for a fraction of what he normally makes in terms of salary. Mm. So let's do something good. It's not he's not doing it for the money. He's just going to phone it in. He's going to push back if he's got questions. If he's got concerns, he's going to bring it up. And he did. And I and and sometimes he was right. Sometimes Paul was right. Sometimes he needed convincing, and Paul was good about doing that as well. Right. And um and and that that's that you rarely get. I mean, well, I, look, know, I know, think, so Paul, I think you handled it well. Well, I think what the ideal scenario is when everybody is working to make the th- series better. And and sadly, I don't think that's always the case. You know, I do think sometimes uh, you wor- you've worked on films where people have egos, where they're working because <laughs> where their biggest uh, concern is why somebody else got a bigger trailer than yeah. them. You know, uh, yeah. how early are they going to finish? Uh, what credit? Uh, where is their name going to be on the credits? How many assistants do they have? Why has somebody else got more lines in one scene than them? You know, and they're not working for the for the good of the whole thing. And I, I don't know. That must be horrible. I'd have thought. I, I've, I mean, sadly, in my career, I've witnessed that on so many films because all, all the films I've done are all all different kinds and mm. shapes and sizes of movies. 
you know, or sometimes, like I said, it was just a purely commerce situation and the actors are in there for the paycheck, um, but not. And I mean, I, it was fun for me also to kind of, the only time I think I remember pushing Paul in one direction was when we were casting the police chief uh, that who has to go and talk to. And I thought that two, who was also in the forest, was the right cho- I just thought, I think this guy can deliver. And I don't think Paul was adverse to it, but I just remember thinking, I really think uh, two has, has the, is going to stand up to the Boo character in a way that has to be done. Because Boo is the intimidating character. You see, you see his character, he's subservient to, to Marcus, but almost to nobody else. He's a, he's a badass. And all of a sudden it's like, we needed somebody that when Boo shows up, you know, needs this information. And the guy's gonna basically reprimand him and get in his face and, and give him that warning. And I knew two could do it, and I think I mm. two just delivered so well. And that one one night of shooting, and he just did this one little cameo, and he was just brilliant, and he just nailed it. It was all in Thai, and it was all it was a, such a Thai moment for the movie, which was great. I just loved it, and the the beautiful drone shot for that scene, and and um, just the way it was written to, to show the the sort of sort of the hypocrisy of powerful people, not just Westerners, but here's a powerful person in a Thai structure who also has a little bit of a dark side to him too. And it's super subtle. Most people don't even get it in that scene, but it's there. And you see that complex side of this guy, this police chief, and uh, it's, it's great. And then I, I just knew that he could pull it off. And I remember just saying, we gotta get, we gotta get to in, um, and do it. I don't think we need to audition anybody. Let's just make the offer. And he came in like a friend and a trooper, and he did, was a great guy. I mean, just sort of looking back on the whole sort of process, I mean, overall, I mean, what do you think Unanalia says about society? I mean, Marcus's murderous, murderous obsession for the perfect deal, there's Boo's blind servitude, there's Nam's uh, sacrifice, and a sister's crest uh, for revenge. I mean, what are you hoping audiences will take away from this miniseries? Well, look, I think as I've got older, I have started to see the world less in black and white. Um, The more you learn, the more you understand that you don't know. Uh, I mean, maybe that one of the first times I really remember that was when I was researching my first film in the UK called Underground. Um, which was about the, the oh God, that was ages ago. When was that? Uh, that was in the eight, was late 80s, 90s. I can't remember. Was you, it 92, I think. Was it not? You, you've, done, you've obviously done your research, yeah. you know, far my, my, more about my career than I do. <laughs> but, uh, but he the, is getting old. I'm trying to lose it a little bit, yeah. And I remember being introduced to, you know, the, the drug dealer. And I'd had a rather sheltered life, surprisingly. But, uh, and, and I expected to find, you know, the mobsters with machine guns. And it was this uh, rather quaint little couple who lived in a house and uh, and had tea and biscuits with us. And it was my first realization that, that things aren't always what you have perceived, uh, that there's always a gray area. And so one of the things in Eulenia was really to portray um, evil but an evil that is not obvious. Um, I mean, you know, we've, we've got a character here that I think if he existed in real life, a lot of people would admire him, he would be fated, he would be awarded. Um, and yet, you know, this, this very dark uh, motivation. So, but we also didn't want to just create you know, a, a cliched, normal film type sociopath. And in fact, one of the things we worked uh, w- was the hardest, I think, for Alec to, 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 to deal with was the idea that it was, it, we couldn't let Alec, the actor, think of his character as a bad guy. Mm. I really wanted to, to get Alec, the actor, to think, to see it from this man's point of view and to play him as the hero. Um, so I, I hope that when people watch the, this, that they see a complexity to the plot and, and actually are put to a certain extent in the shoes of this man 
who has this incredible uh, compulsion for evil that he has tried to control and tries to deal with in the most humane way possible. Yeah, and I, th I think it's evil rationalized. It's evil reasoned. That's what, what certainly what attracted me to the story and, and the revenge element too, which I, I love that kind of mm -hmm. story. But, but the complexity of the evil the, and where it comes from, from his perspective and whatever, you know, not, not speaking on a, you know, where his psychological makeup may have come from, but purely from, a, from an intellectual perspective, he is completely rational and reasoned. And, um, and it's certainly in the third episode, when you listen to him, you know, when he talks about this, is, he's never explained this to anybody before, and he, the way he explains it to Lech, it's, uh, I think that just says so much there. So just sort of a final sort of question for you. What's your dream project if money and time wasn't an issue? Well, one of the dream projects is is to make the next three episodes of Eulenia. Um, I mean, this was uh, always created as, as, as six episodes and, and uh, might well have been right now had it not been for, for COVID interrupting us. So there are various little things we planted in the first three episodes that really need explaining. Um, and uh, we, we hope that, uh, you know, we, we went ahead with this idea of releasing these three episodes. And uh, wouldn't it be great if people liked it and we get to make three more? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, I mean, there was one, I guess there's one thing that sort of stuck out to me was the French ambassador's wife, who clearly seemed to have known Marcus. In, uh, in, in, in the, was sort of like left sort of like hanging and I also like wondered because I guess to me when I was watching it, my takeaway is it seemed quite novelistic in, in terms of way what the, uh, the way the story was sort of laid out and there were these sort of like bits that were out and I always wondered to myself that yes this is sort of three episodes but it seems to be part of a much sort of larger story and um, without going into spoilerific uh, territory what would those other three episodes look like and how would the sort of story continue well the idea is the first three episodes very much deal with Marcus Hammond, the businessman. And the next three episodes take a slight twist and deal with his philanthropy. Um, and so whereas if you'd like the first three episodes were a chance for us to have a little go at big business, at the exploitation of the third world, of the evils and tyranny of the billionaires in business and entrepreneurs, the next three will focus more on the, uh, the wonderful perception of, of the philanthropists and charitable people but, and, and the evils behind that. So, I mean, look, we can go on forever with this. It's really all about, you know, pulling the, the curtains back on the the people we admire and finding how horrible they really are. <laughs> yeah, thematically, that's certainly expose kind of elements there is nice. Mm. And and like you said, yeah, one of the things, you know, certainly in making movies, you never necessarily know. I mean, I remember Paul and I were talking about it and we were talking about Breaking Bad, the series. And originally, I remember reading that in the original series, Jesse, uh, Aaron Paul's character, was supposed to die at the end of the first season. Mm -hmm. And they basically said, you know what, we, we like him. He's great. We can't kill him off. Um, so you never always know until you really get into something. You know, when, when it comes off the page and that actor and that, you know, the director and put something on film and you're like, wow, this is interesting. So I think you're right that Paul, Paul would share with me ideas he had um, of things he always wanted to put in it and I and I so certainly in the back of my mind there's all sorts of little things that I've always wanted to explore mm -hmm. with some of the characters and certainly uh Kat Gray who's a good friend of ours uh who played the French ambassador's wife she's just uh, she's got that one little scene mm -hmm. and uh you definitely uh Paul had told me some very interesting ideas of how uh that could be explored even further and I liked them a lot so I'm not going to spoil them but um it's uh, there's some interesting stuff there, and, and I think I think there's just some great characters there that came out, and I think I I'm as a viewer I'm curious I'm curious about the, the Cat Gray I'm curious about the 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 reporter I'm curious about the police captain all, all those are interesting people that I could just watch for hours so it's like okay well then I think we're in good shape then but of course you know well, this has been a project that we've you know, worked on for quite a while and we've put a lot of 
got a lot of time and <laughs> effort into. Right, sure, <laughs> and of course, you know, very shortly it will be out and there'll be a mm. chance for people to see it. And, you know, the competition for eyeballs, if you like, is is tough. You know, you've not only got the, you know, the traditional channels, there's Netflix, there's Hulu, there's the satellite channels, there's everybody wants you to watch there. Um, you know, we're, we're very happy it's coming out on, on Amazon. Mm. Uh, but uh, and, and look, we hope that people will watch it. And if they like it, tell their friends. And if they don't, tell nobody. And... Uh, <laughs> 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 and, uh, and, and that we get to carry on the story. And what's the best place for people to check out um, Yulinalia? Or where would you sort of direct them to, point them to, to go and check check it out? Well, from the, it's the 24th yeah. of uh, July. Um, it will be on uh, Amazon Prime Video in uh, UK and USA uh, initially. Um, so uh, I think initially you might have to pay two pounds or something to watch it. Um, eventually, uh, it will be on the for Prime subscribers yeah. as as well. Or maybe a month later. Okay. So Amazon Prime Video, uh, Eulenia, you you can't get confused. There's no other film ever been made. I made a film called The Forest, and mm-hmm. somebody else made this film the same title, the same year. But I think we're guaranteed nobody's going to make a, a series called Eulenia. So there you have it. I had a great time chatting with Paul and David, and you can check out Eulenia on Amazon Prime right now. Just hit the link in the description box below. And don't forget to check out more great content on Aruba.com, from film reviews, video game hot takes, and top 10 videos. And why not sign up and become a member and share your passion for all things entertainment on Aruba.com today. And you can like and subscribe to I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify and YouTube and maybe leave a comment or review if you like. And you can support the podcast on Subscribestar at www.subscribestar.com forward slash I Was Just Wondering with Tom Salmon right now. Thank you so much for listening. I've been Tom and I'll catch up with you next episode.